It's my delight to be able to welcome you again to this ministry of Grace Baptist Church in Essex, to our normal congregation. I'd like to be able to say it's a delight to see you. I'm imagining you. Uh, I look forward to that day when we'll be able to get together again and I can see you face to face. Uh, for those of you who have never been to Grace Baptist Church in Essex or just visiting with us today, we welcome you as well to this opportunity for the ministry of the Word of God. There's not a lot of certainties with regards to this pandemic, but one thing I can say I believe with certainty is that we're one week closer to be able to gather together, and uh, I'm really thankful to God for that. As we start this time, let's look to God in prayer. Let's ask him for his blessing. Our gracious God, we thank you for this day that you have given to us. We thank you for this opportunity using this technology to be able to worship you through the study of your word. And we do pray that you would be honored and glorified. Father, receive the praises of your people. We ask that you would come by your spirit and bless your word to our hearts. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Let's take our Bibles now. Please turn with me to the book of Psalms, number 70. The book of Psalms is so helpful because in many ways it's a whole book on worship as God's people come from their various circumstances and seek the Lord and give themselves to him. And here in Psalm 70, we have David again writing this psalm, and it's clear he's writing out of a time of great difficulty. It should be very encouraging and helpful to us. Psalm number 70. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let them be put to shame and confusion who seek my life. Let them be turned back and brought to dishonor who delight in my hurt. Let them turn back because of their shame who say, Aha, aha. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say evermore, God is great, but I am poor and needy. Hasten to me, O God. You are my help and my deliverer. O Lord, do not delay. Now, as I was looking over this psalm, I was impressed with the boldness that David had in seeking God's help. He says, make haste, O God, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. And then in the last uh, sentence, you are my help and my deliverer, O Lord, do not delay. For us as creatures to say something like that to God takes a lot of boldness, a lot of boldness that I think is inspired by the Spirit of God and the Word of God, because we have, how do I put it best? maybe not influence with God, maybe that's not the right way to put it, pull with God. Through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the gospel, we have courage to be able to say to God, Lord, don't delay, but come quickly and help me. That's really an amazing thing, and I, I don't think we use that confidence and boldness as much as we ought to. David also reminds us here, of the blessing that people know who seek the Lord. He says in verse 4, May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. What an encouragement for us all today that if we will seek God with all of our heart, we will be blessed in ways we can't even begin to imagine. So let's do that. Let's seek God fervently. And then even the encouragement here, for people who don't feel worthy of being in God's presence. David says in the beginning of verse 5, But I am poor and needy. 
he clearly didn't see himself as one worthy to be found in God's presence or worthy of God's help or worthy of God's blessing. And yet he was still able to ask for that. So no matter how you come today, whether you're confident in your standing in the grace of God or whether you're very weak, whether you're looking on yourself like David, I'm poor and needy, Lord, why am I even here? We can look to God because he's a gracious God and we know he blesses people who don't deserve it. And that's our great hope. Now I want to read a hymn to you. And it's a hymn I think that's going to be very appropriate to what we consider today. In the Blue hymn, Trinity Hymn Book, it's number 581. It's based on the text in Psalm 16. Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. To thee, O Lord, I fly, and on thy help depend. Thou art my Lord and King most high, do thou my soul defend. A heritage for me, Jehovah will remain. My portion rich and full is he, my right he will maintain. The lot to me that fell is beautiful and fair. The heritage in which I dwell is good beyond compare. I praise the Lord above, whose counsel guides aright. My heart instructs me in his love in seasons of the night. I keep before me still the Lord whom I have proved. At my right hand he guards from ill, and I shall not be moved. Life's pathway thou wilt show. To thy right hand wilt guide, where streams of pleasure ever flow, and boundless joys abide. Amen. Well, here is David, and despite the many troubles he experienced in life, he was able to recognize God's blessing, and even to say, the lot, the, the piece of ground where I'm standing, it's a beautiful place. You've brought great blessings upon my head. What a good and faithful God you are. And I trust that you can say that today as you look over your life and recognize how good God has been to you. Well, I trust that you're praying faithfully during this time of pandemic when we're separated and unable to go to church. Prayer is a great tool that God has given to us, and no one, no matter what the circumstances, can ever take prayer away from us. As a church, it's a blessing for us to gather on Wednesday night in our Zoom meetings, and if you're not participating with us, I encourage you to do that. Uh, the security improvements just continue week by week. But let's pray now together. Uh, as you would join your mind and heart with mine as I would lead us. And let's go to God again and ask him for important things for this time. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, how we bless you that you are our God. And we know that nothing can separate us from you. Nothing can separate us from your love which is toward us in the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that Christ has purchased this great blessing for us by his death and his resurrection. Help us to use it more faithfully, more confidently. Help us to come to you like David did, asking you for great things. Our Father, we would remember our brethren around the world who are in very similar circumstances to us today. We think of brethren in the Far East and brothers and sisters in Australia and New Zealand and uh, people in Europe and in the UK and uh, sister churches in the States and throughout Canada. Father, so many that we don't even know of. And how we pray that you would bless your people as they gather together using whatever means available and seek to worship you. Father, wherever you are worshipped in spirit and truth, wherever your word goes out faithfully, will you come by your spirit and bless your people. 
Father, we ask that you would give us practical help in our homes, that you would pour grace into our homes. You know that most of us are spending a lot more time together than we normally do. And even though in many ways this is a blessing, on the other hand, there can be some struggles and frustrations and difficulties. Give us grace. Give us grace as men to lead our families wisely and to love our wives as Christ loved the church. Lord, help the wives as they go about their responsibilities and perhaps have more on their plate right now with children at home uh, full time. Lord, would you bless them and help them, help them as they seek to follow their husband's leading and, and love their husband and children and care for them. Father, help the children. Their lives have been turned upside down too. Many have been taken out of school. They're at home now. Uh, they don't have opportunity to be with friends and relatives and people at church. Lord, please help them. Give them uh, an understanding of what's going on. And, and may this be a time when they're challenged to trust you. Father, we pray for our witness to our neighbors. We know that the people of this world are always watching us. And so we pray that we would have a testimony of trust in you, of, of putting away fear and worry and, and having a calm confidence in your sovereign rule in this world. Lord, we pray that you'd open up opportunities for us to be able to talk to our neighbors. And Father, we do ask you sincerely and fervently, will you help us as a church to be able to open up soon? that we would be able to gather and worship you and, and fellowship together in the ways that you want us to in normal times. Please, our God, move in the hearts of our government officials and, and cause this virus to go down, down, even to the point of disappearing, that there wouldn't be any danger. Please, our God, work this out uh, to your honor and glory and for our good. And we do ask again that today you would bless your word as we consider it and work in our hearts in ways that you know that we need it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, please take your Bibles once again and turn with me to the book of Philippians chapter 4, where we were last week. Philippians chapter 4, Paul's letter to this church in Philippi, a church that he had founded by the preaching of the gospel under God's blessing, and a church that he obviously uh, loved very deeply. Paul was writing from prison in Rome. Uh, he was, in terms of his physical needs, in great need. And this church had taken up an offering. They'd sent it to him in Rome. They'd sent one of their pastors, Epaphroditus, he obviously brought the gift and was going to stay with Paul and look after him. And so this section that we're looking at in Philippians 4 is the thank you note at the end of the letter. Let's read it again, Philippians 4, verses 10 to 13. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So last week, we looked at this thank you note from the Apostle Paul to the Philippian church. And as he thanked them for renewing their concern for him and this wonderful gift, it becomes a tremendous statement about contentment in the Christian life. And we were reminded that Paul had known a great variety of circumstances. There were times when he had been full and overflowing. Other times he had been empty and in great need. 
But in all of them, as he tells us, he had learned the secret of being content. And we saw that this word he uses here, content, means to have enough, to be satisfied. It conveys a certain peace of soul, a calmness where a person is happy with their lot in light, in life. Now, we saw Paul applying this to his financial situation. Whether he was living in plenty or whether he had very little, the grace of God enabled him to be content, to be at peace with his circumstances. Now, that's surely the primary application of this text. And I think we all know the challenge of facing varying financial circumstances. Uh, the challenge of being content if we have very little and the temptation to always want more. And so uh, dealing with that by learning contentment. And then the dangers of having a lot. And again there, uh, learning to be content. I have enough, Lord. You've satisfied me fully. These are issues that we have to face as believers since our relationship to things, to finances and possessions is a good judge of the state of our hearts before the Lord. Now, I believe a practical approach to life will help us to understand that this subject of contentment applies to a lot more than just financial issues. There are many circumstances that we find ourselves in where the challenge of contentment is placed before us. Will we be satisfied with the hand that we have been dealt? Is our soul at peace over matters that confront us continually? Does how we live our lives reflect the serenity about God's will for our lives? So let's again consider this issue of contentment. But let's take it into other areas where we can make legitimate application. And we're not going to study every area where we can apply this teaching about contentment. But I want to draw out some major areas and then you'll be able to just sort of think it through more in other areas that perhaps you have to face. So first of all, and I'm bringing these issues in terms of questions. Are you content with yourself as a person that God has made? Are you content with yourself as a person that God has made? Now, that may seem like a silly question to some of you. You may never think about it at all. But there are a lot of people who are deeply dissatisfied with who they are. They wish they were taller or shorter. They would like to have been born with a different color of hair. They don't like the body shape that they have. And as you know, much of the plastic surgery industry in our day is driven by people's dissatisfaction with what they look like. This issue has become so important in our society that we have even reached the stage where there are people who are not happy with the gender that they were born with. Such discontent has fueled the transgender movement that we hear so much about all the time. Now, dissatisfaction with yourself or, or this whole idea of what you look like is not a subject that the Bible is silent about. Any serious reader of scripture will know that physical appearance is something that is often noted in the scriptures. Sarah, for instance, Abraham's wife, was noted for being a great beauty in her day. It became the basis for Abraham's fear as they traveled, and the half-truth, it became the basis for the half-truth of telling kings that she was only his half-sister. Now, David is noted as being a very handsome young man. That is highlighted in the, his introduction in 1 Samuel. The Lord Jesus, on the other hand, was prophesied as one who would be plain looking. In that famous 
uh, prophecy of Isaiah 53, we read, He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. It's often said in commenting on this prophecy, he didn't have movie star looks. So it's clear that God has made people in a great variety of ways, and, and the Bible recognizes that. God has, often, uh, has also given people a great variety of gifts. We don't all have the same IQ. Some are easily A students. Others struggle to get C's and D's. Some have great mental abilities. Others have great skills with their hands. Some of us have only ordinary abilities. But here's the challenge that's before us. Are you content with yourself as a person made by God? Or are you continually troubled and discontented with who you are? The issue is important because, as I've said, you are a person that God has made. You are the way that you are because of God's design. Now, I know when I was a boy, I was mercilessly teased for having red hair and freckles and i hated that and i would have gladly traded my hair color and skin with someone else but nobody wanted it the only way to come to contentment over those things was to recognize that i'm the way i am because that's god's plan for my life it's the lesson we have to learn with david from psalm 139 that we were formed by God in our mother's womb. We're his creation. And so the challenge is, are you content with God's design and plan for you and your life? Oh, I wouldn't want anyone to misunderstand me. Contentment with who you are doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to improve. For instance, in some 45 we read about the bride of solomon and how she made herself beautiful for her wedding day we might call this the biblical doctrine of trying to be the best person that you can be so contentment doesn't mean that you go around with unkempt hair or fail to give any consideration to how you look the same applies to our gifts and abilities just because you don't have the highest IQ doesn't mean that you shouldn't try to improve your mind and hone your skills. I know I'll never uh, be a Spurgeon in terms of a preacher, but it doesn't mean that I shouldn't work at being the best preacher that I can. But here's the bottom line. Are you content with the person that God has made you to be? A second issue for us to take up as we think of a broader application of this doctrine of contentment. So secondly, are you content with your spouse? Are you content with your spouse? Now you might wonder why I would pick such a subject to be included in this message on contentment. Well, the reason is simple. One of the largest reasons for divorce is dissatisfaction with your spouse, a lack of contentment with the person you married. Now, no one could have imagined it on the wedding day. You picture two people who seem so desperately in love with one another. But as the days wore on and turned into weeks and into months and into years, the dissatisfaction began to set in. She wasn't all that you imagined she would be. He proved to be disappointing in so many ways. Till death do us part seems like such a faded memory. Lack of contentment with your spouse had set in. Now this is a very real problem among married people. And Christians are not immune to the struggle. And if that discontent is left unchecked, it can end up destroying a marriage. So what do we have to do to make sure the lack of contentment with your spouse doesn't ruin your relationship? 
Well, the first thing you have to do is recognize that lack of contentment. It may be manifested by a general lack of happiness in your marriage. You don't enjoy being together. You don't sort of run towards those times when you can spend time together. Frustrations and conflict seem to mark the times when you are together more than peace and true fellowship. It could even be marked by wandering eyes or daydreaming about being married to the perfect partner. Whatever it is, you have to begin by recognizing the problem and, and acknowledge, at least to yourself, I've got a heart that's full of discontent towards my spouse. A second thing you need to do to work at this problem, you have to recognize what this lack of contentment with your spouse says about God. You have to recognize what this lack of contentment with your spouse says about God. It's important to remember that your spouse isn't just someone that you picked. Your spouse is someone that God gave to you. He or she is a gift from God. Eve wasn't simply some generic woman that God gave to Adam so that he could have a wife. She was created specifically with Adam's particular needs in mind to be the perfect complement to him. And together they made a wonderful union, a God-blessed relationship. You remember that when they had their first marriage problems, it came quickly on the heels of their first sin. They were clearly not happy with each other. Discontent was obvious. And Adam made that incredibly revealing statement to God. He said, the woman you gave me. As though God was to blame. That he had made some mistake in bringing Eve to him. That God had given Adam damaged goods. Now what a statement. And when we're thinking clearly, we would never dare to say anything like that to God. But when discontent gets hold of our souls, it wreaks havoc with our thoughts. How easy to forget what we might have gladly confessed on our wedding day. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Proverbs 18.22 But when discontent begins to set in, we forget that this spouse is a gift from God, an indication of his grace, of his goodness, of his mercy towards us to provide what we need in life. And so as we deal with our discontent, we have to deal with our hearts before God when we recognize that this discontent with our spouses uh, has settled in. Third thing that we need to be doing, you have to take measures to restore contentment with your spouse. You have to take measures to restore contentment with your spouse. Now, this is not the place to launch into a series on contentment in marriage. That certainly would be good for us to consider. But let me just offer a few counsels. If this is a problem you're struggling with, you have to pray about it. Because it's a spiritual issue. It's, a, it's an issue in your heart. And we can't change our own hearts. Only God can change our hearts. And so you've got to be praying about it. You've got to be coming to God and pleading with him that by his spirit, he would help you to put sin to death and to have grace in its place to do what you need to do. So you've got to be praying about this problem. In our Philippians text, Paul told us that contentment was something to be learned. And so we need to go to those passages in the Word of God that are going to help us either remember or refresh or maybe learn for the first time what it means to have a spouse given to us by God. We we'll have to go back to the Bible's teaching about marriage. 
Perhaps go to that opening text at the end of Genesis 2 and learn about God's purpose for marriage. Or go to some of those passages in the book of Proverbs and the Song of Solomon and be reminded of the joys of this relationship that God has given to us and pray that God would restore those things in our relationship. We need to listen to the teaching of Jesus on marriage and get counsel from him about how we should view our marriage and ask for his help because we know that he prays for us. And take up those classic texts in Paul's letters where marriage is set before us and especially its connection with the gospel. Most of you know how beautiful those texts are, especially in Ephesians 5, where we have the picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, the heavenly Savior, who is also the heavenly bridegroom. And he lays down his life for his bride. He gives himself, he sheds his blood, he dies on the cross for his church. What great, incredible love that is. And the bride, on the other hand, the, the, the wife, is the church. And she gladly submits herself to her husband as the church submits to Christ. And it brings about a glorious, harmonious, peaceful relationship. Oh. We just have to think about the gospel to be reminded about basic truths of marriage and asking God that we would again, whether you're the husband or whether you're the wife, live out those roles that God has given to us as marriage is to reflect the gospel. And God will use that. He'll bless that to restore a true contentment to our hearts. Well, may God enable you to be able to look at your spouse today and say, thank God for such a partner. I am satisfied. I have enough. Well, that brings us to consider a third issue as we seek to make a more general application of the doctrine of contentment. So here's the third question. Are you content with circumstances in your life that are beyond your control? Are you content with circumstances in your life that are beyond your control? Now, we've all experienced things in our lives that we have no control over. It might be that we're driving on the highway and an incredible snowstorm or a, or a, a, a rain, thunder, lightning storm comes up and we're forced to stop on the side of the highway. That's clearly a circumstance over which we have no control. Or perhaps it's the failure of a business where you're working and as a result, you lose your job. It's not something you had any control over, but it's come to you and it's turned your life upside down. Perhaps it's a medical condition, some disease that has completely changed your life, or a body part like a knee or a hip that has worn out. Now, these are circumstances in which largely we have no control. We know that the Apostle Paul experienced things like these. As he wrote his letter to the Philippians, he was a prisoner of the Romans, awaiting sentencing before Caesar's court. He lacked basic freedoms and liberty. It was a situation over which he had no control. On the journey he made to this point in his life in Rome, he'd experienced an incredible naval disaster in which the ship he was traveling in was wrecked on a beach and they were thrown into the water and, and basically barely escaped uh, with their lives. That was something over which Paul had absolutely no control. We also know he'd experienced great physical trials. There was a thorn in the flesh. We don't really know what that was, but you picture a thorn in your flesh, how painful that would be. He appeared to have had some serious 
eye troubles. These were all circumstances beyond his control. When we read the book of Job in the Old Testament, we know that he experienced these kinds of circumstances. Great storms that killed his children. Foreign raiders that stole his livestock and burned up his property. The collapse of his health that left him sitting this incredibly wealthy man. He was reduced to sitting in the town garbage dump, scraping his sores with a piece of broken clay pot. Initially, he had a really good response. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Surely it was a statement that reflected a heart that was content with his circumstances. He was at peace. But as time wore on and the trials didn't end, we know that Job became very bitter, even cursing the day of his birth and wishing that he'd been still born rather than seeing the light of life. Contentment flew out the window, and Job began to question God about what was going on in his life. These were circumstances outside of his control. He could do nothing to change them. But he was responsible for his heart and his response to these things. And his heart was in a very dangerous place. This content took over the peace, the serenity. It was all gone. That can clearly happen to God's people. We can't sit back and criticize Job. I think we've all been there. Having experienced circumstances outside of our control and we don't like it. And so we begin to murmur and complain and grumble and the peace goes and there's no content before the Lord with our lives. Circumstances come beyond our control. And so there's no peace left in our souls. It's a terrible way to live. How can we be content in circumstances like that that are beyond our control? How can we have peace in our souls when everything outside of our souls seems to be raging? Well, the key is to get our eyes fixed on God. That's what made such a huge change in Job's thinking and heart. In mercy, God came to him in the midst of his bitterness. Not with answers about all of his problems, Job probably never completely understood why these things had come to him. But God came simply to refocus Job's eyes on God. To help him see God as the sovereign, almighty ruler over all things. This is what enabled Paul to be at peace in a Roman prison. To know that God had brought him there. To know that God was working all of this out to further the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. It was the sight of God in control that changed everything for him. I came across this beautiful statement by the Puritan Thomas Brooks, and in Old English, he sort of nails it on the head. Men that do not see God in an affliction are easily cast into a feverish fit. They will quickly be in a flame, and when their passions are up, they will begin to be saucy and make no bones of telling God to his face that they do well to be angry. Those who see the hand of God in their afflictions will with David lay their hands upon their mouths. If God's hand is not seen, the heart will fret and rage under afflictions. When afflictions arrest us, we shall murmur and grumble and struggle until we see that it is God that strikes. We must see him as King of Kings and Lord of Lords and stoop under his almighty majestic hand. Well, that's it, isn't it? It's your sight of God that impacts all of life. It's your understanding of how God is so intimately involved in all of the details of your life 
that changes everything in terms of your outlook. And especially when you remember, if you're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, that this God who's in charge of all things is your Father in heaven. And he loves you so, so deeply. He would never do anything to hurt you needlessly. His plans are always for your good, to bring you closer to himself, to separate you from your sins, to prepare you for an eternity in his presence, to make you more useful in the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. Dear people, perhaps even now, you're struggling with some circumstances that are outside of your control. In many ways, that's exactly what this pandemic is. We not, may not have been touched personally, but in many ways, our lives have been turned upside down. What should be the most important thing to us, desired above all else, to be able to dwell in the presence of God where he wants us to gather in the Church of Christ, that's been taken away from us for a time. And there are other issues that many of you have had to deal with over the past year or that you may face in the year to come. Are you content with what God has ordained? Is there truly a peace in your soul about your life? Are you able to rest in your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ? Remember that not only did he die on the cross in your place, but he's gone to heaven to be your mediator, to be your advocate at the right hand of God, and he's praying for you there, and he's interceding for you there. He's ministering to you from that heavenly place. Are you able to rest in the Savior? Perhaps today you're watching this and, and you're not saved. You've, you've never come to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. And so this issue of contentment, it's really a stranger to you. You can't be content. In a sense, your life is like riding on the stormy waves of the ocean all the time up, down, up, down, and there are fears, and there are worries, and there are anxieties, and you're troubled about this and troubled about that. That's your life. You don't know what it means truly to be content. You're never going to have that until you come to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Christ invites you to do that in the gospel. He says very clearly in that well-known gospel invitation at the end of Matthew chapter 11, Come to me, all you who are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So bring your burdens to the Lord Jesus. Bring your burdens of sin. Bring your burdens of guilt. Bring your burdens of fear about the judgment of God and an eternity in hell. Bring everything that troubled your heart and just cast it on the Lord Jesus. And he will be your helper. He will change your life. He will put peace into your souls, a soul of peace that you've never had before. He will promise to never leave or forsake you. He'll always be with you. What a blessing that is to know the Lord Jesus Christ and to know the contentment that we can have as his followers. So dear people, as we consider again the broader application of, of Paul's teaching, are you content? Content with who you are? As someone made by God. Content with your spouse if you're married. Content with circumstances that you have no control over. I urge you today to spend some time with God in prayer and examine your heart with these questions and perhaps other things. You know best where your heart is struggling and where 
Contentment is a real issue. May the Lord give you grace to take his word under the blessing of the Spirit and have dealings with God and live in a way that honors our gracious Savior. I want you to listen to a very well-known hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. I think that's a good way for us to conclude our time by thinking about the truths here. Based in Philippians chapter 4, the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And peace like a river attendeth my way. When sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. O oh Lord, haste the day when the faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Amen. May you be able to say that today because you're trusting in God and you know grace from him to be content with all that God has given to you. Well, let's close our time in prayer. Our gracious God, how kind you are to us to bring us your word. Lord, by your spirit, may it be working in our minds and hearts. May we be willing honestly to examine ourselves and recognize those areas where we are not content, where we are not at peace. And may we bring them to you and may we take the word of God in prayer. And Father, would you help us to work towards that peace, that serenity that ought to mark our hearts. Father, if there are those who are listening today and they're outside of Christ, they don't know the Lord Jesus. Will you bless your word and will you draw them by your Holy Spirit to know the Lord Jesus as a gracious God and Lord and Savior? Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. And now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. Well, Again, it's been a delight for me to be able to minister to you today. And let's keep praying that God will have us back together soon. Bye for now.